In the last episode one talked about machine code and said that this is what a computer understands. Computers understand ones and zeros, but machine code doesn't look like ones and zeros. What is it about? Well, computer chips, these processors, are at their most microscopic level fascinating, magical, and at the same time somewhat boring, composed of billions of almost unimaginably small electrical switches, each of which is either on or off. If I could take this processor and a scanning electron microscope, which is possible, and there are videos on YouTube documenting this process where people do similar research and gradually enlarge the image, we would eventually get to billions of microscopic electrical switches or transistors on this chip, with each of them in the on or off state. To be clear, to be a successful programmer, you don't need to learn much about the processors, integrated circuits, transistors, capacitors, and bistable flip-flops that constitute the hardware. Our job is to create software, which requires different skills. Just like a surgeon, he or she must be able to use tools such as a scalpel or an ECG machine, but he or she does not need to have thorough knowledge of their structure. However, it is worth having some knowledge about processors so as not to treat them as something magical, but to understand how they work and how they affect the operation of our programs. Of course, I'm simplifying, modern processors contain not only billions of transistors, but also a whole range of different combinations and arrangements of these switches. These various chips are used by the processor in conjunction with other computer components, such as memory modules, to perform a variety of tasks from representing numerical values and text, to storing graphics, sound and all running programs. It is these complex operations performed by the processor and other components that determine what exactly is happening in the computer at any given moment. And yes, this may seem puzzling, and it's not immediately obvious, how we can take a few tiny switches and say that this pack is now a Chopin concert, and this pack of switches is a picture of a beautiful race car. Well, I can't show you billions of switches, so let's start with one, for example. I will use this symbol for a switch, it can be on or off. And the important thing is not whether it is related to something, whether it causes something to happen somewhere else, no, it is the switch itself, in itself, because I can decide what I want it to mean. What it represents is up to me and may be different in my program than in yours, provided that what it represents only has two possibilities. In a computer program I could decide that this means the user is logged in or not logged in, so we have two states. I could use another one to say I'm currently recording or not recording. But what I can't use one of them for is something more complex. I can't use one toggle to represent my bank balance, my lab results, or my invoice as a PDF, but I can add more toggles, I can group them together because we have a ridiculously large number of them available. And if I have a group of two switches, I go from two possible values to four possible values. Both switches can be off, one can be off and the other on, and vice versa, and both can be on. Okay, fine, it's still simple, but whenever I add a switch, I'm not just adding two more options, not just another enable slash disable, I'm actually doubling the amount of values we can store. When we go from one to two switches it will not make an impression, we need to go further. So with two switches I have these four possibilities, that we just saw, it's still very simple. If I add one more switch, I will have the same four possibilities that I had a second ago with this new third switch. So I went through four to eight possible three switch arrangements. Every time I add one switch, I double the possible values again. So the possibilities grow rapidly, always doubling. With three switches there are eight possible arrangements, with four switches there are 16 possible arrangements, with five switches it is 32, then 64, then 128, and when we have eight switches there are already 256 possible arrangements, of all off, all on, and everything in between. I've been using these toggle icons, but they're reaching the end of their usefulness, I can't fit in anymore, but I still need a way to describe these arrangements. I could use words to represent them, but that's a bit clumsy, and what I can do is use zero for the off state and one for the on state. This is a very concise way to do it. In calculations we use zeros and ones, this is the binary code we use to represent the most basic part of a computer. 
There aren't actually numbers 0 and 1 floating around in your computer, they're just ways we can represent or visualize that these tiny things are on or off. Now let me correct myself, I called them switches, but in computer science we don't call each of these elements a switch, we call it somewhat in reference to a binary digit, the smallest piece of information that is 0 or 1 so in all these examples I have 8 bits. 256 possible arrangements from all zeros to all ones and everything in between. So I could use a group of 8 bits and decide that it represents some modest number that I need to keep track of. Perhaps the number of treasures on the screen. As far as I know, this number never has to be greater than 256, because I only need these 8 bits to keep track of it. If I need to store larger values, I need to add more bits. And since computers are really built around this binary concept, it's easier to manipulate multiples of 2. If I go from 8 bits to 16 we go from 256 to about 65, 000, 000, 000 possible values, if we double this again to 32 bits, we already have 4.3 billion possible values, while at 64 bits, well, I don't know how to say it, but it's a lot. You may have even heard phrases like 16-bit architecture, 32-bit architecture, or 64-bit architecture, and this refers to the number of bits that the processor is most willing to handle and work with. Usually the more the better. No modern processor wants to deal with just one measly chunk of time, it's just not very useful. And the thing is that 64 bits can represent very huge numbers, but of course I don't need to use them just to represent a number. Because I could also take the same 64 bits, but decide to use that particular set of information to represent an 8 by 8 pixel area of the computer screen, and use the zeros and ones to turn 64 specific pixels on or off. This way we can take some switches and use them to represent the image of a race car. Back to machine code, why aren't they ones and zeros? Well, in a way they are. Let me explain this with the example of apples. If I'm a shopkeeper and at the beginning of each day I count the number of apples I have for sale, then whatever the quantity is, I could write it down in words. 36. Or I could use decimal digits, 3 and 6. Or Roman numerals, XXXVI, or I could mark on the board. Or I could use hands or little pictures of apples. Whichever option I use, they all mean the same thing, none of these values are approximate, they are all exactly 36. They are just different methods of conveying the same information. We will use whichever method is most useful at the time, which will usually be the most concise and compact method. And that's what's happening here. Machine code can be displayed in binary format, but a format called hexadecimal or hexadecimal is more commonly used. We can display more information in a smaller area by using hexadecimal instead of binary. If I have any of these 8-bit groups and I need to label these circuits, in binary mode I need 8 ones and zeros. But using hexadecimal, I only need 2 digits, because each hexadecimal digit can have 16 values, from 0 to 9, but also from A to F, instead of just 2 different values, 0 and 1, that we get with each binary digit. So what is in binary format becomes what is in hexadecimal format. So when we see machine code, there are specific details about which bits are 0 and which are 1, it just uses a more concise way of displaying it. At this point, we do not need to delve into the details of binary or hexadecimal notation, or the translation between them this is not necessary at the initial stage of learning. However, it is worth knowing that in the rare case where a programmer needs to analyze information at such a detailed level that it is more convenient to present it in hexadecimal rather than binary format. 